I'm Walter Block. I'm Jody M. Reeves. This is Adam Kokesh. I'm Jeffrey Tucker. I'm Ben Swan. I'm Tom Woods. I'm Peter Schiff. I'm Eric Voorhees. And you're listening to... And you're listening... And you're listening to... You're listening... You're listening to... Ed and Ethan. Soak up the awesomeness. You are listening to Ed Nathan, the voice of liberty in Canada, coming to you from Saskatoon in the province of Saskatchewan, my intrepid, amazing, talented, and beyond reproach, I guess, Ed, <laughs> the, the, the talented co-host Yay, that you are. it's Ed. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> so spunky. My gosh. Wow. The energy that flows from you. I expect better. Uh, I think I'm going to have to garnish your wages. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you take uh, yeah, from zero? Uh, exactly. <laughs> I am, of course, your humble host, very humble, Ethan. Uh, we're You're listening to us on Liberty Express Radio, libertyexpressradio.com, LRN, LMR, Daily Paul, Freedom Phalanx, Voluntary Virtues. We're at all those locations and more. You can check out edandethan.com to subscribe to our RSS feed. Listen to us directly. Put us in your ears. That sounded pretty you, naughty. You, you, get a, you get our after show with the RSS feed. Too. That's right. You get the after show. That Right. Benefit. There's benefit to cruising on over to our website. So do it. Do it now. edandethan.com. Ethan, Ethan writes some decent articles, too, every once in a while. Not for the last like month and a half. Ah, that's okay. You know, You're agro service is busy. It, it bi- is biz- crazy. busy, busy. Yeah. Anyway, I I English good. I English really well. Me speak it really good. Make all time. I ha- I have a stack <laughs> of things, honey do list uh, to do. Uh, oh, so it's yeah, that's right. It's uh, see me living the single life night right now. I, I I don't have to worry about that anymore. Mm-hmm. Like I ever did. All right. So anyway, uh, we've also got a surprise <laughs> for the listeners. There is another person in studio. He's lurking right now behind the mic. His name is Andrew Bassett. He joins us as our third chair today. So, Andrew, thanks a bunch. Well, thanks for having me on your show. Oh, yeah, no, that's a fun. I guess uh, we're going to talk. I want to get to a Bitcoin thing right away. But before we do, uh, there is actually a specific reason that you're here. And that's because I wanted to talk to you about kind of unschooling, because your background is not one in which, you know, that that is uh, uh, could be described as having been spent in the public school system. Right. Right. So you are you do the you were you never went to school or what's the how how you know what was your schooling experience right well there's this concept known as unschooling uh, mm-hmm. basically it means you don't go to any public school you don't go go to a private school uh, you pretty much teach yourself uh, that's not a hundred percent the case I mm-hmm. you know my my so parents you have, you have guidance and interaction with exactly. other people right uh, to some degree yeah yeah so uh, so, and we'll get into all of this later, but I just, do you, I, I, for the listeners, do you, are, are you in a cardboard box? Or are you generally just not successful? <laughs> you don't, you don't, you do, you know, obviously, because uh, uh, you didn't go to school, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty tough. Yeah. But you wear really nice clothes for a homeless guy. I know. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, know, I know how to stretch a dollar. <laughs> I, that's good. It's a good skill to have, you know. Yeah. You know all right. I don't know. Obviously, we're joking around. Actually, what is it you do for a living? What's... What's right. your occupation? Yeah, well, I work at IBM. Okay. I, my job title is I'm an applications analyst. Okay, so because I went to public school, I have no idea what that means. Right. You, what does an applications analyst do? <laughs> uh, I basically uh, look at old programs, figure out what they're doing, and figure out how to make them better. Super cool. So I right. know code. So this is a good, yeah. uh, good. Uh, do you know a little bit of Bitcoin code? I do. I've followed quite oh, a. I don't okay. know any. I don't know any specific code. Actually, I haven't looked at it. But okay, yeah, okay. I do follow the. You Bitcoin. could understand it if if you saw it, is is because me and Ethan, are or, just or like, if what? you studied it. Yeah, you could get into it if you. I wanted could definitely. To. Hmm. Yeah. Future core cool. developer right here. No. I, <laughs> okay. So we're gonna make uh, our own cryptocurrency. <laughs> they add an Ethan coin. Like, yeah, yeah, what's that going to trade at? Less than a penny? <laughs> hey, that's All what right. Bitcoin was at one point. So you know, Oh, right. there, that, that's exactly right. So, you know, success in waiting. All right. Um, actually, there is already a coin out there for the Freedom Fiends, isn't there? Is, is it Kitty coin? Kitty oh, coin? Oh, really? I think huh. so. Well, there's the LBT coin, I know. We're, oh, right, we're right, waiting right. on some of that, I think. Uh, I, th- I don't know. I haven't kept up with that. All right. So anyway, look, uh, right now in the world of Bitcoin, there is a, I guess you call it a big issue, right? Um, yeah. So right now, uh, there is a mining pool 
called ghash.io, and uh, it's gained a very large portion of the network. Uh, 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 in fact, it was, I think it was actually over 50% uh, before we were recording, uh, I think Wait, yesterday. You're, you're talking 50% of the entire Bitcoin network? Yeah, so basically how this works is, um, the way I like to describe it is if you if you start out at the very beginning of Bitcoin, right, and you're the only computer uh, auditing the Bitcoin network, you're the only one on there, so you get... A block reward at that time of 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes, oh. right? So that's how mining right. worked. Now, if you added a second computer, uh, then you get, on average, statistically, one block reward every 20 minutes because now you and another computer are competing well, for the it, same it wouldn't, block reward. It wouldn't be 20. Like, so the first one would be 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes, and the second one wouldn't that be... 25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes? Or? 25 Bitcoin is the number of Bitcoin that was now, uh, that, that every four years or so, the block reward for right. finding it a block. goes down. Yeah, it gets cut in half. Um, so what I was referring to was computers competing for the one block reward every 10 minutes, right? right? So statistically, you start out, if you're the only computer on the network, you get that single block reward every 10 minutes. You add a second computer of equal power to the network, then you'd both be competing for that block reward. So statistically, every 20 minutes, now you'd get the 50 Bitcoin block reward. Yeah. Well, so, the, the Bitcoins dissipate over time at a constant rate, pretty much, no matter how much computing power is going on right mm -hmm. that's right that's right so no matter no matter how much computing power you add to the network the rate of issuance is the same over yep. time um there's some technological sort of foibles there as to how that does change a little bit there's variance in that but it but that is not core to the that is not important to the core concept that mm -hmm. is how mining works more people that join the network increase the difficulty to mine to that yes. aspect. Yes. But I like to keep it to competition. It's yeah. just different market players are competing for mm -hmm. a block reward every 10 minutes. So, okay. Um, the the problem that you run into is if, if one market participant starts auditing the Bitcoin network, mining it, because miners are auditing the every transaction, excuse me, that goes on. Um, what happens is if one network participant gains control of 50% or more of the Bitcoin network, they have a statistical advantage over all other miners, which means that if they want to, let's say I am a malicious miner, I have 51% of the uh, network hash rate, I want to send you, Andrew, a uh, dollar worth of Bitcoin, and then at the same time, I'm going to send that dollar, that very same dollar worth of Bitcoin to Ed. Mm -hmm. So that's a counterfeit You're transaction. You're not supposed to do that. That's You're not right. Supposed be, not supposed to be able to do that. That's right. Yeah. So the mining network is supposed to prevent that in that when miners see it, they say one of these transactions is invalid. So it doesn't get a confirmation. And it doesn't get audited to say it's okay. I'm just like, I don't understand how they would actually do it. Like, like would they do they press it like on two different computer screens at the same time? And then, well, like, I'm confused of how the the how it actually would would happen. How would you set the process in, in motion? It's okay, in 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 the background, in the darkness of the the code. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 there there are there are different ways you could execute a double spend attack. There's, they're very technical. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go into that because yeah. I don't even fully understand okay. it myself. Okay, but it's possible. It's possible is what okay. counts, right? So, uh. Where where you run into a major problem is is basically the, the reason that becomes possible when you have 50% or more of the network as a miner is because you're now in a position where you have the majority voice to say these transactions are valid. So mm -hmm. when you announce uh, a new block, which is a new page in the ledger book that records all of Bitcoin's transactions, you announce it to the network the network basically looks at whoever has issued or whatever blockchain or bundle of pages in the ledger book, if you want to put it that way, uh, whichever blockchain is longer, the network recognizes that as the legitimate blockchain. So a miner could, in theory, uh, a miner could validate invalid transactions, mm -hmm. but only up to a certain point because there is a there is a point where one of those transactions will be audited as invalid because it the bitcoin network has to consolidate it can't just say you know sure there are more coins being spent for some reason cuz if it could then it the whole system it doesn't make sense yeah, yeah. 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 So so i, I kind of understand how that works where the if if any one party controls more than 
fifty percent of uh, of all the computing power on the network, basically. Yeah, uh, that's a. But is that actually in reality possible? Because I know that there's a lot of computing power on the Bitcoin network. Well, okay. So what makes this possible and a problem right now is that ghash.io, as an example, is a mining pool, right? So a bunch of different people who are mining on the network individually, they really have no financial hope of ever dominating the network. Well, like, why, why would they pool together? Okay, so the reason that miners would pool together to all mine uh, as, as one sort of organization uh, and then split up the profits between themselves is to reduce variance. So when, when you're mining on the Bitcoin network, if you, okay, in theory, if you point your mining hardware at a pool and expect to get a full block reward, you know, right now it's 25 Bitcoins. So if you expect to get 25 Bitcoins statistically within a month, right, then right. then you could also mine independently and find that one Bitcoin blockchain stati- or block statistically within about a month. Okay. The problem, though, is that the variance is so high. You could find that, that single block in a matter of a couple of minutes, or it might take you 20 years. Right, so you might be spending all this power and you might get absolutely nothing to show for it. That's well, right. So it's kind of like buying a mutual fund instead of buying an individual stock. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. That's, a, that's a good way to put it. There's, it, it, it. It's just to produce as much predictability as possible, yeah. right? So this produces a kind of a weird incentive in the Bitcoin mining world, is that if you do if you if you're looking at uh, a way to reduce variance, you have to look at the largest mining pools because the largest mining pools have the least amount of variance. And if you're trying to squeeze as much profit as you can out of your Bitcoin mining hardware, uh, decreased amounts of variance help you achieve that. So it's kind of a weird contradiction in in incentives. You don't want a mining pool to be in control of 50% or more of the Bitcoin network because if they are, they become a point of potential failure, right? So if a, if a government, uh, for instance, exerts influence on the mining pool, then that mining pool could damage the Bitcoin network somehow, perhaps censor transactions or, or double spend if they're malicious, right? And by the way, it's worth mentioning that the people who run uh, ghash.io do have a history in which they have engaged in double spend mm. transactions. It was against a gambling website. So this, to me, is a very clear indicator that they have a history so, of uh, malicious acts. So, so how, how big are they right now, though? I think right now, uh, since we're okay, since recording right now, I think uh, they've come down to about forty. Yeah, okay, forty-two percent of the network. They were up actually over fifty percent earlier so yeah, i remember it, seeing okay. it on reddit yeah yeah so so 42 percent of all the computing on the entire bitcoin network is through one party one pool and one, yeah essentially it's one party one pool control that that could be controlled by a single person potentially See, satoshi yeah. envisioned it to be cpu power one cpu one vote type of thing sort of it, yeah well yeah. kind of wow it, <laughs> and and so this one person is essentially controlling all the computing power that the people are voluntarily going into um they're voluntarily lending their computing power yeah. to that person right so uh the the, the so what's the solution to this 51 percent attack then well the solution is playing out as we speak okay. um and, and it's 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 kind of funny because when this does crop up and it has cropped up more than once this is like the third time i think in the past mm-hmm. like year ish something think. like that yeah when this situation does crop up it's kind of funny because I, I i see people talking about how I said this was a problem and people laughed at me. Well, look now, it's a problem. Well, also, look now, the solution is playing itself out. Um, There is, I I mentioned these weird competing incentives. So the one incentive for, for seeking out decreased variance kind of acts against a different incentive, which is if you have, if you're part of a mining pool that does dominate the network, you are part of an organization that is directly affecting the confidence of Bitcoin. In fact, mm. I, I, you could argue certainly that right now Bitcoin price is having a lot of trouble towards the downside <laughs> because uh, because people are, are concerned about the integrity of the network. I know there was a big run up, so after a big run up, there's usually yes. a down. Well. In this aspect, case, in this case, be. it's it's uh, it's well, it's always difficult to determine specifically yeah. what moves price, right? But in this case, uh, certainly there are people who uh, have a vested interest in keeping the security, the integrity of the network alive. So, 
on the one hand, you may want to go to the largest mining pool to reduce variance, yeah. but on the other hand, you want to be part of organizations that are not necessarily dominant of the network because you understand that it reduces confidence in the network. So, so there's kind of an incentive to be part of the, the largest pool mm -hmm. in some way. You, you, get, you basically get the same upside with uh, just with a lower level of, uh, a, well, not, not necessarily risk, but well, if, le if, le less, well, like you said, less variance. Yes. Yeah. But if the trading value of your Bitcoin tanks because you're part of a large organization that's that's causing confidence in the network to drop, yeah. It's <laughs> kind of, so so do you think that the the what is it, ghash.io, uh, hmm. their their uh, portion of the whole network has been going down because of that? Yes. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there has actually been uh, it's it's kind of funny. There uh, there have been people posting online talking about how they are specifically moving their hashing power away from ghash.io to to uh, restore and instill confidence in the network. There's also uh, there are market based solutions here as well on Havelock Investments, uh, a crypto a crypto uh, stocks uh, investment site, which I. I, I wouldn't recommend, but it's interesting anyway. Um, there's a an equity there for Petamine, which is a company that uh, basically just, they what they do is they pay out dividends. They use half of the mining profits that, that they uh, accrue from mining to buy new equipment, and the other half they use to pay out dividends. Right, so hmm. investors are. You, they they get profit, but they also get a share in an increasingly large That's cool. Bitcoin mining operation. But the reason they're interesting is because they have publicly stated that they are going to move away from ghash.io. So now what's really funny about this is, is investors have started in the Bitcoin mm. world, have started investing in Petamine. So not only just to get their uh, dividends, but also because they want to uh, invest in a company that is is trying specifically to to uh, keep confidence alive in the Bitcoin network. So that's pretty neat. And, and the community has also uh, well, one solution: uh, P two pool. Uh, oh yeah, mining uh, pool, which is essentially. Uh, it's 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 decentralization of the mining pool. So instead of one person controlling it, it is a protocol that is controlling controlling it, which is essentially you would think that that would only be the main one. Like maybe over time we'll see that one grow. Well, the, it's yeah, really small it's, still. It's there are problems for Peter Pool, uh, which. I guess include variants because it's smaller, but uh, with an increase in the number of people using it, that uh, that may play out to be the best choice. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, and there's another thing too: uh, a 51 percent attack is if 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 ghash.io was in fact malicious or more malicious. I I really do think that they are a malicious market actor, but that's just because of their history, not necessarily what they're doing now. But even if that was the case, look, a, a double spend uh, from somebody who controls a large portion of the network is made difficult, I think, by uh, something called Rule 13 in the uh, protocol for uh, block messages okay. on, on the Bitcoin network. And look, I don't fully understand this myself. I'm not going to try to explain it uh, uh, to any detail because I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. It seems no one actually really talks about Rule 13. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's really no information out there on it. And that's something I think really should be uh, rectified. If you are in the Bitcoin community or a developer, uh, you need to check into Rule 13 so it can be more properly explained because I think this has uh, major implications for whether or not a 51% attack is conceivable even after a couple of hours tweet us at ed and ethan or send us an email at feedback at ed and .com if you know more about this that'd yeah be great you know educate us um but basically rule 13 says that uh if there are six blocks mined on the blockchain block number seven cannot exceed the timestamp for block number seven between it and block number six cannot exceed the median time of the past six blocks so you know 
digest that in your brain chuck it out the other ear uh i think it needs to be looked into because this is intriguing to me it it would seem to imply that keeping a double spend confirmed past six blocks may be practically impossible to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is why people recommend the six confirmation things. It's not just an arbitrary number. So, yeah. so what you're saying is that even if someone f- somehow did get 51% and used it to their advantage, it would still not work out and mess up the network. Yeah, that's that's what this would seem to imply to me. Like I said, there's really no information out there on Rule 13, uh, but Rule 13 for block messages, I think, is is would strongly imply that yeah, this is just not uh, conceivable. It's not possible to to carry out with any uh, uh, notable level of success. So. We've burned almost through the full the the, the, the whole first half. Um, was, I guess we've got a few minutes left, right, Ed? We've got about three minutes, four minutes left. Oh well, you know, there you go. Um, I guess, geez, you, you we, we would take a longer time to talk about bonds, right? So, <laughs> so why don't we uh, just quickly mention multi bit? I think that's probably the best idea okay. here. Um, multi bit. I, I wanted to talk about multi bit uh, quite a. F- well, what, like three or four weeks yeah, ago? Yeah, a little while ago, yeah. A um, couple of weeks ago, I don't know. Oh, wow, this is actually from June. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> so I don't even know it's if this good. story it's is relevant good. anymore, but it's interesting nonetheless. So Multibit ran into a problem, right? So they have this really cool uh, wallet application, lots of downloads, over a million and a half. Uh, and and uh, in fact, I guess uh, at the time of the writing of this story at Coindesk, uh, they put the estimate more like 1.8 million uh, so that's not bad. Lots of people using the wallet, right? But basically, as a labor of love, this wallet as a free project uh, started to be very taxing for the developers, right? In, yeah, in terms get, of time, yeah, lots of questions and yeah, stuff lots like of that. support requests, all that stuff. So what they what they decided to do was they said, okay, well, any transaction that goes through the multi bit wallet will attach a very 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 small fee. Right. Uh, And the idea behind it was we have, you know, you know, almost two million users. Right. Mm. So if every one of them pays a little small fee, this this is still we're talking about Bitcoin here. Yes. Some other currency. Okay. Yeah. So the idea here was that because they had such a large user base, they could depend on collecting a very small fee fee from that user base to fund their project. Right. And, And when you say very, very tiny, how tiny is it? Oh gosh, I think it was uh, like a couple t- pennies or something. Not even. What is uh, it? Well, is it a percentage basis of a transaction? No, or? every transaction would have a set amount oh, okay. attached to it. Huh. Right. So the 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 reason this interested me is because it's kind of like how governments think. Yeah. You, you get this kind of a you know we have a tax base, so if we charge everybody you know fifty dollars in taxes for the next year, we'll collect fifty dollars from every taxpayer. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it makes sense, right? Except when taxpayers start to say, "Well, I'm going to conceal income or whatever. I'm going to find yeah. a way around the payment." Multi-bit. There's, <laughs> they had two options, right? They could have imposed this tax because that's what it is. It's a, it's essentially a tax. It's an opt-out because you can just stop using well, wait, multi-bit. Wait, wait, if you so want. wait, well, what is the value proposition? Like, why would, why do people use multi-bit instead of spending their own uh, bitcoins? normally good question i mean look multi-bit is just a wallet application right so it's a place to have public private keys which is what many other wallets do so they had a couple of options right here in the minute we've got left basically what happens is they could have imposed this tax or they could have said we'll add a value-added feature that people might want to pay for so they Mm -hmm. opted instead for the fee that they you know would collect from their users i honestly think that's kind of why they'll die (laughs) <laughs> yeah. is because they, yeah. they didn't add they didn't go for the value added they didn't go we're gonna work on providing something our customers would want to buy instead what they're gonna do is they're gonna impose a fee on what their customers are already getting for free from them and their competitors and yeah. I think that's a mistake I will um, agree yeah. yeah so okay we're gonna continue on to the second half and I'm gonna kind of give Andrew some breathing room so he can actually talk we're gonna you know yeah. gonna give him yeah. some actual freedom to chat rather than have me just rant about bitcoin for the whole you know hour or whatever um so yeah come back after the break we're gonna go for these valuable messages depending on which stream you're on maybe more valuable for other streams and we'll be back right away this is ed and ethan we 
know you're tired of all the useless background chatter from the mainstream media. It's no wonder they struggle as much as they do, despite all the resources they're given, but that's why we're here. Be sure to visit us at edandethan.com to check out our newest updates, and while you're there, hit the donate button to help us further develop our product for your benefit. If you're a Bitcoin fan, look for our Bitcoin wallet address on the edandethan.com homepage and throw us some Satoshis. Of course, you could always just stick with the status quo. It's just great because it's got all the answers. Zombie what brains? Now from Global Edmonton, the news hour with Gordon. Brains. This is CNN. Brains. This is CTV News. Brains. CBC News. Brains. 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 The Ed and Ethan Podcast. Come to where the brains are. <laughs> All right. Once again, unto the breach. Brains. <laughs> are we putting brains <laughs> in yeah, again? I don't know. Haven't sure. we had brains in for the last hey, like three shows? No, no. We put it in last one and then we hadn't had it for like a long time. Okay. For so the un- uninitiated, Andrew, this is our promo spot that we plug in for our own stream or mm-hmm. RSS feed. I yeah, yeah. Call it a stream. Well, it goes out on a couple of voluntary virtues and uh, freedom flan- okay. phalanx. They mm-hmm. get that too. Yeah, we put in our own homemade promos for the show. One of them is a zombie seeking out brains, and he finally <laughs> finds them at Ed and Ethan. That's why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I wanted to, we took up the whole first segment with Bitcoin, which is always a fun pleasure to do. Um, you know, I'm sure there are some uh, listeners out there on various affiliates who went, I don't know what that's all about. So why don't we talk about something more, uh, I guess, personable, right? Uh, more mm-hmm. relatable for individuals and that is andrew the reason that you're here today i wanted to talk to you about the whole unschooling experience uh, ed's very curious about yes, uh, parenting stuff and the background that you've gone through there so let's rehash though first so you are a, a program what was it program analyst applications analyst Appli- okay you're an applications analyst at ibm so not living in a cardboard box you seem to have done you seem to have done well uh, okay for yourself uh but you haven't gone through the public school system, so now do you have secondary education to get that job? Is that, that yeah? Okay. Absolutely. Okay, and you're I, able to actually write and uh, and and read and everything. <laughs> so that's that's good. Babe, <laughs> what degree? Give. Like it's, it's, it seems so weird. Like we we say this and it's ridiculous, but people seriously, that's a huge objection. You don't send your kid to public school; they're not going to know how to read and do math. That is a huge legitimate objection people put forth. Well, I mean, it's like saying if we don't uh, if we don't uh, pay for the roads, they won't get built. If we don't, (laughs) I mean, yeah, yeah. Same no, logic. It's true. Same it's, logic. You get a, a certain frame of mind that this is how things work, and if it weren't for that, then nothing would ha- nothing would exist. But that's uh, that's not the way it is. It's not typically how reality works out, right? Everybody assumes that if things are not done by the state, by a central planner, typically, if things are not mm. by, done by a central planner, then everybody stands idly by as idle market actors yeah. going, what do we do next? I don't understand. How do I move my arms? <laughs> so, okay. But let, okay, so let let's get to how. I guess is there a way to describe how you were not introduced to school? Like, can you give me? Can you conceptualize wow. for me why you didn't go to public school? Well, yeah, I mean, it was a decision made by my parents. Uh, you know, I uh, I uh, basic well, I basically learned to read at a very early age. Okay, and uh, most of my uh, childhood was. Focused on video games. Um, uh, yeah. Like, 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 basically, you were seeking out leisure. Is, is that kind of, would that be fair to say? Or Yeah, like basically, think of what a kid does when he comes home from uh, from school. And then <laughs> yeah. that's that's my life every day for <laughs> for uh, for 18 years. Now, awesome. now, did your mom sit you down at the table and said, you're going to have to learn the alphabet. You're going to have to you know you know how to read. We're going to show you how to read. We're going to show you math. Like, was there any of that structure yeah, well, at all? Well, yeah, except it wasn't sitting down at a table. It was sitting on the couch and, uh, and reading uh, reading stories uh, from mm. interesting, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you follow through the words, you learn you learn the alphabet. It's, you know, and, and that's the thing about uh, learning. It does not need to be uh, structured, uh, sitting at a table, hunched over. Okay. Uh, and there, there, and that's really, uh, I think, the main thing is, you know, there's so much to be learned uh, from things that we wouldn't normally consider to be educational, but really are. Right. So basically, it seems like in your situation, 
your interests were what was catered to. Right. And, and I think the idea there is interests uh, tend to drive education mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to the other way around, which is how the public the school system might might try and do it. Well, it's interesting how you say that what you did after school, you know, you had fun or whatever. And uh, uh, for me, uh, my after school was like two hours of homework <laughs> every night. And I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not the smartest guy. <laughs> and uh, obviously, that's not it wasn't working, and it, it doesn't work because there's multiple studies to show that homework is nonsense, in that sense. But I'm just I'm just curious as, like, so do, were your parents were they homeschooled themselves, or what was the genesis? Uh, Why did they want to do this? No, well, I, I I guess for for different reasons. Well, uh, I think my mom was probably the main uh, main decision maker behind uh, the way I was educated, but uh, no, she did not. Uh, care for the uh, public school system. She went to public school. Uh, my parent, both my parents did. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, she basically learned the hard way what's wrong with the what's wrong with the system. And and she uh, was a survivor of it. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> she was one of the smart ones. And this was before the days of the internet too. Now, do you have uh, you do you have siblings at all? Did they go to do they did they go to school? Yeah, yeah. I have work? a I have an older brother and a younger brother. Uh, my younger brother was uh, basically raised the same way I was. He didn't actually. Um, he has never gone to any type of school, uh, but uh, he's and he's got not a, living on the streets. Oh either? no, he's got he's got a good career for himself going. He hmm. uh, takes care of kids. And uh, he's cool. also a firefighter. Oh, oh wow. wow! Awesome. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Automatically handsome in my book. Then, <laughs> so you know, get very similar to yourself. I should add. So your your siblings. Okay, let me get this straight to make sure I've I've understood this. So you okay? You don't go to public. School. You didn't go to public school. Your younger brother didn't. Same. My older brother. Your older. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, basically decided he wanted to go to high school, and he did. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so, so he, but he didn't go to the the grades like the 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 pre high school grades, right? He, no, no. So how did he? Because this is actually very similar to myself. Yeah, I didn't go to school. Well, I did go to school off and on in grades. I think one and three, and I can't remember. But anyway, I but I, I the majority of my schooling was in high school. I found it very difficult to transition into high school. I even assumed I, you know, I, it was my recommendation to the educators <laughs> that they hold me back a grade at least, yeah. right? So, what about what was your brother's experience? Uh, how would you relate that it, transitioning into the public schooling system? How was that for him? Uh, well, it's kind of hard for me to say. I, I don't know. Uh, I was pretty young. He's quite a bit older than me. I should mention. Okay. So when he went to high school, I was probably uh, a toddler at that point. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Um, Has he related much about this experience to you? Well, uh, you know what I I know is that uh, he he felt kind of secluded uh, mm. when mm. and so that was had a lot to do with uh, why he wanted to go to school. He did did want more of the social aspect, and right. you know, and and that's a lot of a thing that people mention a lot is yes. you know if you don't go to school you you lack on the social experience, and I agree with that. Right. But what I would add is that you 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 miss out on certain social experiences, both good and bad. Mm. Sure. Well, I I also think it's not necessarily fair to make that argument because it, really think about it. You're you're saying, look, we've corralled up all the kids in society and we put them in a building. So if you don't go to the building, you don't get to associate with them. Well, hold on. Yeah. What if they were out in the world to begin with, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if that's. I I think that's actually a really unfair sort of thing to say is that you go to socialize, and that's the same well, reason, by the way, I went to public schools because I wanted to socialize. Yes, and I and there is some stigma behind the unschooling or the homeschool because the unschooling is kind of like a new term, but homeschooling uh, terminology where uh, even uh, um, not so much myself, uh, but uh, Amber, she's a little worried about whoa, we need to have him in programs or or, or, or my, my, my son, when he gets to that age where he's going to be going to school, he needs to be participating in social activities. And that is true. And there's tons of different things that he can do. I know you mentioned off air that you uh, did uh, uh, judo or taekwondo or yeah, something taekwondo. like that. Yeah, taekwondo. So I knew it looked scary. <laughs> so there are um, avenues to pursue like after curricular activities. Yeah. Uh, so you can socialize with people. And I know in Saskatoon, they're like uh, there's like a home, uh, the uh, um, unschooling home secular network right. on, on social media where you can interact with other people who are doing the same thing. And uh, uh, I know there's a, a, a um, 
uh, a, a store downtown that Amber goes to uh, quite regularly. They have uh, just get-togethers right. uh, um, with other like-minded individuals who share the same philosophy. Sure. So yeah. you don't... Uh, yeah, you are kind of... Um, you're kind of closed off in that sense. Well, you know, like, I, well, I, think, yeah. I think living in the city uh, can really help with that a lot. Yes. You know? mm-hmm. And like what you mentioned about those, uh, those unschool... Oh, well, is it unschooling groups? It's secular homes, secular homeschooling groups. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's a great. That's not something that I had the benefit of, but I mean, you know, I had I had neighbors and I had a, I had a few friends, not not a whole lot. Well, were okay. Were you in the city or were you also? No, this this is this is rural. So I oh, okay. basically my my parents grew up. I uh, built a house uh, way way out of town, mm-hmm. and um, you know, well, it's very different. I mean, that's what I can say. Sure, yeah. sure. But is uh, this is so? What what is your your personal experience with having? Uh, in, in respect to socialization, because you're in you're in a, a rural area, you said it's kind of difficult. So, is yeah. I guess see, and, and this is something interesting because I went to school and I feel socially awkward uh, because mm. I went to school. <laughs> <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> there's kind of like a it's like to me that's like it's it's the opposite in that sense. But I can see I know I remember uh, going through church. Uh, we had we had to uh, go to like a big meetup with like all the different dioceses or something, yeah. and there was one kid that was there and he was homeschooled and he was uh, everyone was like man that kid is weird and he was kind of he we were we were the only ones that were being nice to him so then he kind of followed us around and everyone was uncomfortable because he said like it's like mama knows best all the time and stuff like this okay. and he was uh, mom was him and his mom lived together and he just yeah but it was it was. It was interesting because everyone recognized that this kid is weird because he doesn't know how to socialize because he's only been with his mom in that sense. And I don't want to have that happen to my, uh, my kids, but right. I don't think that it is going to. And I'm not I'm not worried. I am somewhat worried, but I'm not. Um, uh, I, don't, I can't, can't trans- transition that this into is, a question. This is therapy session for Ed, apparently, today. <laughs> we're, we're almost interviewing Ed. But, it was, <laughs> but no, I, I, like, you... you ha- it seems like you you maybe did have some difficulty in respect to socializing like the normals. Yeah, abs- right? well, absolutely. And I mean, uh, my early years growing up, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years old was were pretty good because I had uh, kids my age who lived right down the road and we, we would hang out. But uh, teen years, that was pretty tough. Uh, right. They, all well, my friends basically moved away. And uh, yeah, no, it was, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It was, uh, socially speaking, it was pretty rough between the ages of, Oh, uh, twelve and twenty. So, did you? Was there was there pressure for you to socialize specifically with with people your own age? Because I remember in my experience, I had a, a very wide breadth of of uh, sorts of people from different yeah. age groups to socialize with. Well, you know, actually, uh, uh, no, because uh, most of my socializing was actually with adults growing up. You know, parents right. would have friends over, and mm-hmm. I'd hang out, and I, you know, I, I grew to become very comfortable with people much older than me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I I can relate to that experience. I same thing for me, right? Is a lot of people in my life who I socialized with on a fairly regular basis, on a, I would call equal footing, were significantly older than me in some cases. So I mean, yeah. I and I I was in a rural area too. I mean, the largest town I grew up in was what like two thousand people, I think. So you know. Not exactly a hustling, bustling metropolis. When, when you get to the point where you are seeking out uh, secondary education, so right. or you know, exactly. so to to move on to your I don't know supercomputer analyst thing, whatever it is you do, the yeah. <laughs> you, so how does how does that journey work? Because you can't show up with the you know government approved piece of paper to say that you're allowed to be educated. So how do you how does that work? Well, the way it uh, actually worked in my case is, uh, well, I went to SIAS. That was where my uh, my education was, and that's uh, that's where the they offer a two year uh, a diploma program, and right, it's kind of like computer science. So, um, but uh, well, basically, what happened was my mom uh, s- uh, signed me up for that, and I had to take a uh, basically an entry exam. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, it basically said, you know, you need to have certain uh, competency in reading, writing, ma- arithmetic, mm-hmm. and, uh, and you they- just barely passed, right? <laughs> you you came in with your club and 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 piece of coal to scribble on the right, paper well, with, right? You know, and 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 normally. <laughs> 
they require a certain high school education and diploma mm-hmm. and like a GED uh, or something. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. Or equi- a high school or a GED. Uh, but when they saw my scores, they, they, they threw that out the window. They said, ah. you're in. Yeah. Well, <laughs> right on. <laughs> like, amazing. I, I just, you, you, yeah. you're challenging convention. Yeah. So when you, I, can you give me an idea? Were your scores exceptionally high? Were they just, or were yeah. they, they were? Hmm. Right on. So now, what when you when you're now? I guess this is a while back to think, but did your parents have to submit some type of uh, paperwork to the state to show that you're being educated when you were being homeschooled? Or are you I, not? I, I, I'm that? not sure about that. I I don't. Th- I know I'm that's sure. the case today. Yeah. But I don't know. You know what? I, I seem to remember that they would come every once a couple of years oh, and ask for someone, some sort of proof, and I think. I think the I think it was kind of like getting out of jury duty. You kind of <laughs> you huh. you you can make up some little lie and yeah. to make them go away. So right, it was like right. it was like a social worker would come to the house and like talk, interview you and and your I parents. Don't or remember something, or? anything like that? I I think they maybe send a letter and they require you to send a letter back and oh. prove it. I, I don't know. Right, hmm. but there's it seems because one of the one of the major concerns, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, like yeah. some jurisdictions yeah. are very unschooling friendly, some jurisdictions are not. By the way, I've lost my timer, Ed. Just so you know, okay, uh, that's good fun. Anyway, um, I mean, some jurisdictions are very friendly to the idea, the concept of unschooling, and some jurisdictions are basically, you know, you have to you have to meet certain educational standards. Uh, test scores have to be just so. Uh, you have to show us that by a such and such an yeah. age, your child can read a certain sort I mean, of. I think that's a perfect example of the kind of homogenization that happens in all forms of government, not just mm. not just edu- You know, that uh, is not a bad point, isn't it? it, it it's hmm. it's. This is my biggest concern with public education is indeed it creates that kind of a monotone One size system. fits all, you know. Yeah. And imagine if government was running our, our clothing stores and they wanted a <laughs> one size fit, fits all uniform for us. That's pretty much what well, we have for our public school. Wasn't it kind of odd to say, you know, we're all our own special snowflake, like we're all very, you know, we're a dynamic creatures that, are, that have ingenuity and imaginations. And by the way, let's go to the black and white system. That, like it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, right? I mean, the, then the argument is, well, people need to be uh, exposed to, you know, various types of education, so at least they have an idea of what they're interested in and what they're right. not. But that's not really how the public school system uh, <laughs> does it. They 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 basically put you through twelve years of a homogenized education, and you know you can't uh, you spend a year deciding and then take. It's not like. Uh, you go to university, you get to uh, basically pick what kind of education you want. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, but we've come to, you know, as a society, we don't think that that's appropriate for uh, for people at a younger age. I'm not sure why. I well, look, we're 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 sold on this idea that younger people don't have enough agency. They don't have enough capability mm-hmm. to make those decisions, even to consult. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I think, I think a large part of that is, is kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, like the, the, uh, <laughs> the babyization of people. I don't know. I don't know what to call that. It, it's, it's, we, we are smarter than you. So we need to take control of your life because you don't know. Essentially. And I think that's another flawed assumption is that uh, adults are smarter than kids. Mm-hmm. It's all, yeah, I think it's like all the opposite because <laughs> kids aren't culturalized. <laughs> Right, so they can see through. Well, that's a, true. The BS, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, there was some, there was a question. Oh, so oh, the 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 age restrictions. So you had friends that were close to your own age, but you all said you also talked with adults. Were the adults like surprised? Like this kid is actually not talking. Like like I remember Dana Martin talking about how she can tell this kid is unschooled and uh, schooled because the, the schooled kids never look her in the eye. Never looked adults in the eye because they're like this authority figure, and and homeschooled mm. kids, they they look they're like evil playing field level. So yeah, your interaction with older folks, what was the was there a different dynamic? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure that I never heard that one actually, Ed, but um, different than different how so? Well, like when I was younger, I was you know very well spoken, had a really well developed vocabulary, right? And this is something that really threw a lot of. Uh, older mm. folks off because they weren't used to some, you know, one of the small people uh, speaking at such a level, right? So did you experience anything oh, like that? absolutely. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, was, was Another win for homeschoolers. Or homeschoolers. I guess. I guess. So obviously, okay. Clearly, no, no. People did not believe that I was. Uh, uh, yeah, that that was one of the main things people would say. Well, you talk like an adult. Right. Right. And and when I was when I was you know, I guess no longer of schooling age, a lot of people I would tell them I was a high school dropout. And it would really take them up. What really? You don't talk like a high school dropout. You don't express yourself that way. I'm yeah. really surprised. It's funny because you do. Yeah. Like, the, the, like they think that like, ah. you know what I mean? Well, I mean, just think of the high school dropouts or college dropouts that you know of. Can you think? Well, I, there's, was it? Uh, well, Bill Mark, Gates is a Bill university Gates, dropout. Mark, well, yeah. Look at all Mark the Mark Zuckerberg, boys, he yeah. dropped out of. Uh, That's right. I think Harvard? Steve I Steve remember. Jobs I went to university and he, I think he dropped out too. Yeah, uh, well, people that are uh, you know and usually become entrepreneurs because they 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 recognize value in 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 the market and they you know they've been shown value to them compassionately and voluntarily, so it just kind of translates uh, into that. Um, so I guess Andrew, have you have you uh, met? Any other unschooled people similar to yourself? Are you like the only one you know of, sort of? Or what, what's my what? family? I don't. I'm not aware of any other uh, truly unschooled right people. Uh, I grew up. I did grow up though with some homeschooled kids. How were the homeschooled? I like what in, in your conception? What is the difference between unschooling and homeschooling? Uh, homeschooling is basically a structured education that takes place at home. Right. And unschooling is a, a completely 100% unstructured education. It's basically your entire childhood is playtime. Right. So now, would you, if you asked your mom, like, does she know that concept of unschooling or she just said, you know, I don't, you're I'm free. Not sure. Uh, she always referred to it as homeschooling. Okay. Because okay. okay. yeah. I, I guess, you know, same for me, right? It was, I was homeschooled, but really it was just you know, constant, constant rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, so. So if you okay, so obviously there's a difference between school unschooling and homeschooling. You were clearly unschooled. You've learned to read and write. Surprisingly, you have a successful career. It, yeah. I get. Is there is there? Do you think honest merit to the worry that maybe for some people a structured schooling environment, uh, you know, especially for people maybe on the autism spectrum, that kind of thing, these people are better served by a centrally planned, structured schooling environment. Well, you're gonna it's gonna be a you're gonna have a hard time convincing me that a centrally planned environment is <laughs> is ideal for anyone. Uh, but no, I I think that there are uh, you know just because it uh, worked out pretty well in my case doesn't mean it would for anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some people definitely do a lot better in more of a structured learning environment. And but there's no reason to say that it has to be uh, centrally controlled and homogenized. Right. Mm -hmm. That's true. So Andrew, when you uh, find the right lady and settle down, are you going to <laughs> are you going to uh, unschool your kids too, or, or what uh, I, I I won't be having kids, but um, uh, no. Okay. Um, wretched creature. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just horrible, horrible things. <laughs> but uh, you know, if I was, oh, that's actually. You know, if hypothetically I did have kids, that's actually kind of a tough question. Um, you know, a, lot, the... a lot of it has to do with where you live, uh, who you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. uh, it would be a real hard sell to get me to want to have kids and put it through a public system. But um, Right. See, for, for me, it's, you know, should I go and repeat that? I guess, you know, from stepdad to bio dad. That <laughs> if, if I do that... Uh, I, for me, it's easy. Yeah. I don't, well, I don't, I don't want to, but another thing you got to understand encourage though is, that. is right now, uh, our educate, uh, public education system is sort of turned into socialized daycare. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you yeah. decided you don't want to have kids in school, well, you're going to have to pay for, uh, uh, you know, some Everybody other sort of, of care. So yeah. mm -hmm. there's a huge financial disincentive to, uh, homeschooling your kids. Wow, so, that's a good point. So now, so the Andrew of today, would you go back and uh, what would you say to your mom to change things to uh, something different that, that yeah. would happen? Um, I, I suppose there are more things I could have done to uh, to try to uh, find people to socialize with and maybe in my teenage years. I mean, that was pretty tough. 
Right. That seems to be one of the toughest in any environment, not just the unschooling, homeschooling. Ed, you mentioned there your own sort of social awkwardness, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like that to me speaks to a broader sort of cultural dysfunction that's very common. The sort of there, there are a lot of uh, ideas that we kind of take for granted that, you know, okay, first, you know, uh, the authority figure at school that's so so ingrained into how people think commonly mm-hmm. that you know i th- i think it creates problems for people socially how we socialize there's yeah uh, i've gone on facebook i've written novels about <laughs> about about how people are uh, uh kind of uh, poisoned in, in, in how they think about communicating well, with one another. Yeah, and it's tough too like just thinking back now uh, like the family structure is authoritarian or at least my family was uh, like p- hockey, uh, I played hockey, authoritarian structure there school, completely authoritarian church, completely authoritarian I mm. grew up in a completely authoritarian world um, and then now you, you know you're let go, be free, and then I'm just like uh, uh, I don't know how to, I don't know how to be free. I like being told what to do. Yeah. Well, I'm comfortable in that. Yeah, it seems like that. I don't know, Andrew. But just you know, as the music comes up and we're on our way into the after show. By the way, uh, we 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 should yeah we're we're gonna go into the after show. We've got other stories to talk about, and Andrew will join us for that as well. But I guess I don't know. Just any final quick thoughts about uh, would you? Are you thankful, at the very least, for being unschooled as compared to being schooled, homeschooled, or public schooled? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Good well, stuff. we'll be back after the music breaks and all that good stuff. Uh, in the meantime, be sure to stay tuned right here on LibertyExpressRadio.com for more great content. You know you know what's coming. More greatness. All right. <laughs> um, also, uh, tune in to uh, or check out the website, EdandEthan.com. Find all of our stuff there. Twitter feedback at edneathan.com if you want to send us anything via the emaily tubes or whatever. Twitter at edneathan.com if you want to scream and shout at us in public. Thanks again for listening. This is Ed and Ethan. <laughs>